Hi, I'm Chris Holland, and this is what you could have Googled in 30 seconds. Today, we tackle that much quoted cause for the Civil War, states' rights. Growing up in the South, I was surrounded by rebel flags and Confederate monuments. They were carried by Klan members marching in parades. They were waved by little children at Tater Day. I'd see them on the backs of pickup trucks circling the park on Martin Luther King Jr. Day. I'd see them flown over official city buildings of justice and punishment. It would be very easy to connect the rebel flag to the South's history of racism, but not so fast. Yokels and youngins will declare that the flag and the war for which it was fought was not over slavery, but was over states' rights. So what are states' rights? Firstly, we need to define states' rights. States' rights are the autonomy of each state to make jurisdictional decisions about its own laws and liberties, superseding the will of the federal government or mandating that the federal government abstain from enforcing laws in certain categories. We've seen states' rights come up recently in reference to same-sex marriage, whereby the individual states wanted to legislate the legality of such marriages until the federal government legalized them nationwide. Interestingly, it is always those wanting to limit the freedoms of others that take such a keen interest in states' rights. We currently see states' rights in the areas of capital punishment, cannabis reform, and gun control. So it would make sense that the secession of the South could be a reaction to federal overreach trampling states' rights, right? Some states filed an official declaration of causes of secession. So that should clear things up. Except none of the Southern states supported states' rights. You see, slavery was legal at the federal level before the Civil War. It was in the Constitution. It was the northern states that chose to exercise their autonomy from the federal government, abolishing slavery at the state level. Their decision to outlaw slavery meant that escaped slaves suddenly had somewhere they could escape to. States that would not only free them, but also protect them from extradition. Slave owners were not amused. In fact, South Carolina's official declaration of secession noted an increasing hostility on the part of non-slaveholding states to the institution of slavery and protested that northern states had failed to fulfill their constitutional obligations by interfering with the return of fugitive slaves to bondage. South Carolina also objected that New York outlawed slavery transit, meaning that delegates traveling through New York could not bring an entourage of slaves to attend them, for they would be free the moment they hit New York soil. They fumed at New England for letting black men vote. So I guess South Carolina really did secede over slavery. Maybe I'm picking the wrong state as an example. I mean, we have 10 to go. Mississippi's January 1861 secession declaration states, our position is thoroughly identified with the institution of slavery, the greatest material interest of the world. Its labor supplies the product which constitutes by far the largest and most important portions of the commerce of the earth. A blow at slavery is a blow at commerce and civilization. Okay, so maybe we have nine states to go. The federal government, having perverted said powers, not only to the injury of the people of Virginia, but to the oppression of all the southern slaveholding states. Yeah, sounds like Virginia isn't the best example, either. Georgia seemed to have quite a bit to say, but it all kept going back to the same subject. Slavery was forbidden in the country northwest of the Ohio River by what is called the Ordinance of 1787. We had acquired a large territory by successful war with Mexico. How, in relation to slavery, was the question then demanding solution? This state of facts gave form and shape to the anti-slavery sentiment throughout the North, and the conflict began. Northern anti-slavery men of all parties asserted the right to exclude slavery from the territory. This insulting and unconstitutional demand was met with great moderation and firmness by the South. We had shed our blood and paid our money in its acquisition. We demanded a division of it. So, technically, this is about states' rights, specifically the right of future states in our Pacific expansion to become slavery states. This references the Missouri Compromise, which banned slavery above the 36-degree parallel in 1820. It was repealed in 1854 by the Kansas-Nebraska Act and is considered a central reason for the Civil War. How about Texas, who was received as a commonwealth holding, maintaining and protecting the institution known as Negro slavery, the servitude of the African to the white race within her limits, a relation that had existed from the first settlement of her wilderness by the white race and which her people intended should exist in all future time. The northern states, 
by solemn legislative enactments, have deliberately, directly, or indirectly violated the fugitive slave cause of the federal constitution. They demand the abolition of Negro slavery throughout the Confederacy, the recognition of political equality between the white and Negro races, and avow their determination to press on their crusade against us, so long as a Negro slave remains in these states. They have for years past encouraged and sustained lawless organizations to steal our slaves and prevent their recapture. We hold as undeniable truths that the governments of the various states and the Confederacy itself were established exclusively by the white race for themselves and their posterity, that the African race had no agency in their establishment, that they were rightfully held and regarded as an inferior and dependent race, and in that condition only, could their existence in this country be rendered beneficial or tolerable? <sighs> they couldn't be as racist as that sounds, right? Let's read on. The federal government has for years almost entirely failed to protect the lives and property of the people of Texas against the Indian savages on our border and more recently against the murderous forays of banditti from the neighboring territory of Mexico. Wow. Um, <clears throat> a bunch of Texas. All right. The other states in the Confederacy didn't file declarations of causes, but they did file articles of secession. That must be where we will uncover our elusive states' rights explanation. Alabama, that bastion of racial equality, wrote, and as it is the desire and purpose of the people of Alabama to meet the slaveholding states of the South who may approve such purpose in order to frame a provisional as well as a permanent government. Okay, then. The rest of the Articles of Secession seem almost verbatim identical, with only slight variations and no actual reason stated, as if they were an agreed-upon statement that each of the remaining states ratified and submitted. It looks like I'll have to dig even deeper to figure those out. Maybe I should look at the transcripts of the discussions for secession. Here we have Arkansas politician George Smoot, who added the resolution that the platform on the party known as the Black Republican Party contains unconstitutional dogmas, dangerous in their tendency and highly derogatory to the rights of slave states, and among them, the insulting, injurious, and untruthful enunciation of the right of the African race of their country to social and political equality with the whites. At the Florida Secession Convention, President John McGahey said, At the South, and with our people, of course, slavery is the element of all value, and a destruction of that destroys all that is property. In 1860, North Carolina joined other Southern Democrats in supporting John C. Breckinridge for president on a platform protecting states' rights of slavery in the Western territories. When he lost to Abraham Lincoln, they too seceded from the Union. Secessioner Commissioner George Williamson said, Louisiana looks to the formation of a Southern Confederacy to preserve the blessings of African slavery. As the basis of our new government, we hope to form a slave-holding Confederacy that will secure to us and our remotest posterity the great blessings its authors designed in the Federal Union. Although we may not have the reasons for Tennessee readily available, it is very telling that in their landslide vote to secede, the Appalachian areas were the only ones that voted against it, the one area that had no slaves or dependence on the slave trade. The common thread here in every documented case is slavery. It was only about states' rights when they wanted the new territories to be slave states, or when they disapproved of the northern states' rights to abolition. Many of the documents I read zealously defend the Constitution because at that point in time, slavery was condoned, so they saw themselves as true patriots, defending American principles handed down from the Founding Fathers. In their eyes, the North, by outlawing slavery, was committing treason, and by repealing the Missouri Compromise made it clear they intended to outlaw slavery across the nation. With the Southern economy dependent on slaves, they chose to declare war on the United States. The Confederate flag stands for committing violence against the government to preserve the institution of slavery, plain and simple. Any other motivations behind it, such as states' rights, taxes, or tariffs, are red herrings and false narratives created by people that can't admit the mistakes of their ancestors. Tearing down statues and taking down flags will not erase history any more than it has Nazi Germany but they can be displayed in a museum devoted to memorializing the victims so that we frame these events in a proper perspective. 
If you walk down the street wearing a Confederate symbol, it doesn't matter what fabricated meaning you attribute to it. What matters is the fear and intimidation that it sows among your community. You may not consider yourself a racist, but at the end of the day, you don't seem to mind being mistaken for one. You aren't being asked to apologize for being white. You just have to acknowledge the atrocities of past generations, how the ripples of those actions have manifested in systemic racism, and pledge to be a part of the solution by listening and taking action. What they did a century and a half ago doesn't have to define you unless you allow it. Bonus shit you could have Googled. In the Articles of Secession for Every State, not once are tariffs or taxes mentioned. This is due to the fact that the South had actually written the lucrative tariff law that was in place at the time. President James Polk of Tennessee and Treasury Secretary Robert J. Walker of Mississippi drafted the Walker reforms to the tariff system in 1846, resulting in Southern tariffs dropping nearly every year until the Civil War, at which point it was at a 45-year low. In March of 1865, faced with impending defeat, the Confederacy debated the controversial act of allowing blacks to serve in the military. Confederate Secretary of State Robert Toombs argued, In my opinion, the worst calamity that could befall us would be to gain our independence by the valor of our slaves instead of our own. The day that the Army of Virginia allows a Negro regiment to enter their lines as soldiers, they will be degraded, ruined, and disgraced. Two weeks later, the war was over, with Robert E. Lee surrendering his troops to Ulysses S. Grant. There were never black troops in the Confederate Army because it was illegal until that point. The Louisiana Native Guard, whose picture is often cited as proof, was a Union regiment based behind enemy lines in New Orleans. Many Confederate soldiers would bring their own slaves along to the battle lines, but even though they were sometimes pictured in uniforms and with props, they did not serve as soldiers. They were referred to as body servants and served as slaves for the encampment. So no, blacks did not fight for the Confederacy. Kentucky and Missouri are represented as the last two stars on the Confederate flag. So why don't they make the list of the Confederacy? In short, they were neutral, then split their allegiances, making their participation and reasonings more difficult to explain. Missouri pledged neutrality in the war, but also defended its right to slavery. This eventually led Union forces to pursue the Missouri State Guard, and they retreated with their government to the far edge of the state. The Union deposed the incumbent Missouri government and appointed a provisional government. At the same time, the deposed government seceded and joined the Confederacy. In 1864, Union Governor Thomas C. Fletcher emancipated the slaves of his state by executive proclamation, causing violence to erupt throughout Missouri. One militia commander observed, Slavery dies hard. I hear its expiring agonies and witness its contortions in death in every quarter of my district. Kentucky had pledged neutrality as well, with the declaration that if pushed to pick a side, they would join the Confederacy. When Confederate and then Union generals brought troops into Kentucky, the Kentucky State Legislature in Frankfort changed their mind and threw in with the Union. Their reasoning was that the Confederates had invaded first, breaking any good faith with the state. In a direct inversion to what happened in Missouri, this time the Confederacy officially declared the Kentucky government deposed, appointing a provisional shadow government of Confederate sympathizers in Bowling Green. Kentucky would not ratify the 13th Amendment, the one that abolishes slavery, until 1976, 111 years after it was written. One state took even longer to ratify it, and that was Mississippi in 1995. So, both Kentucky and Missouri had two governments at the same time, one recognized by the South and one recognized by the North, with loyalties to both sides of the conflict. This made them subject to waves of racial violence afterwards, known as the War After the War. This included the birth of the Ku Klux Klan, where 17% of black residents in Western Kentucky died at their hands. They terrorized entire towns in Missouri with mass slaughter and enforced black codes in remote areas, which included such things as forced labor, a continuation of slavery. They are recognizable by their white hoods and Confederate flags. The rebel flag as we commonly see it is not actually carried by the Confederate armies. The first battle flag, developed in March 1861, was the Stars and Bars, but it was retired in a few short months due to it being easily confused with the Union flag on the battlefield. In 
In November, this was replaced by the first iteration of the Southern Cross, although this was a square instead of the familiar rectangle. In May of 1863, the Confederacy adopted their first national flag, the Stainless Banner, which put the Southern Cross in a corner on a field of white. It was altered in March of 1865, adding a red stripe and being dubbed the Bloodstained Banner. After the war, the rectangular version of the Southern Cross gained prominence with those still loyal to the defeated insurrection. Carried by former Confederates, sympathizers, and the Klan, it came back to prominent use during the protests over civil rights throughout the 50s and 60s. As a symbol of white pride and segregation, it was used as a tool of intimidation throughout the South. But my favorite flag flown by the Confederacy will always be the last one. I want to thank everyone for watching, and if you enjoyed this video, please hit like and subscribe if you aren't already a subscriber. You'll find the resources and links for this video in the description.